JavaScript promises. Yes, you heard it right. JavaScript can make a promise. No, it's not a million dollar one. It's just a way of saying, I'm working on something. I'll let you know when I'm done. For example, let's say you order a pizza. The shop says, all right, we got your order. We promise we'll get it to you soon. That's exactly what a JavaScript promise is. Something that hasn't happened yet, but will either finish well or run into a problem. Now, here's where it gets fun. If the pizza gets made and delivered, the shop calls you and says, hey, your pizza's ready. That's when you go, then I'll eat it. See that? That word, then, it's your natural next step after the promise is fulfilled. But if something goes wrong, maybe they ran out of cheese or the oven broke, they call you and say, sorry, we can't deliver it. And you respond, in that case, I'll just cook noodles. That's your backup plan, or in JavaScript terms, your catch. You catch the problem and do something else. So in short, JavaScript promises are like making a pizza order. You don't get it right away, but when it's ready, you say, then I'll do this. And if something goes wrong, you catch the problem and move on. All while you're free to do other stuff while waiting. If you still don't understand the concept, let's go with a simple code example. So you can truly see how JavaScript promises work in real development. So first, let's create a constant called my promise. This will be our starting point. After that, we create a new promise object. As you know, a promise is a built-in JavaScript object that represents the eventual result or failure of an asynchronous operation. But why do we use promises? JavaScript is single-threaded and often handles tasks like API calls, file reading, or timeouts asynchronously. Promises allow you to write cleaner code compared to callbacks, handle both success and failure in async operations, chain operations, and manage complex async flows. In short, it allows JavaScript to have a bit of ADHD and enables multitasking behavior. A promise has three key parts. For example here, this is the promise object, which lets us declare a promise. It takes two functions. Resolve is called when the async task succeeds or reject is called when the async task fails. Because a promise has three states, pending, fulfilled, and rejected. Pending means we're still in the initial state, meaning the result is not yet known. Then there's the fulfilled state, which means the operation completed successfully. Lastly, the rejected state, as the name suggests, is when the operation has failed. And here's the last rule. Once a promise is either fulfilled or rejected, it becomes settled and it can't change again. For example, inside our promise object, let's create another constant called data found, which will hold a placeholder value of true. This is just an example. In real development, this could be the result of an API call, a database query, or some condition that tells us whether we have the data or not. Now, based on this data found value, we can decide how the promise will behave. If it's true, we'll call the resolve function and pass a success message like data loaded. If it's false, we'll call the reject function and return an error like data not found. Once we create the promise, we can use the dot then function to run code when it's successfully resolved and the dot catch function to handle errors if it's rejected. When you run this, it prints success data loaded because data found is true. But if you change data found to false, it prints error data not found. Now, I know you might still be confused with the dot then and dot catch, right? To simply explain them, they're just ways to react after the promise finishes doing its thing. Dot then function runs when the promise succeeds, like saying, okay, the data was found, now what do we do with it? It takes the result you passed from resolve function and lets you work with it. That's what we did in this line. Here, result becomes whatever we passed to resolve function. In our case, it logs success, data loaded. Dot catch runs when the promise fails. Like, oops, something went wrong. How do we handle the error? It catches whatever was passed from the reject function and gives us a chance to respond to the error without breaking the app. And that logs error, data not found if something goes wrong. So just remember, dot then equal what to do if it works, while dot catch equals what to do if it fails. This is the core idea behind promises. You're setting up a task that might take time, and you're preparing for both possible outcomes, success or failure. Once that outcome is decided, it's locked in, no going back. Now that you have a slight idea about how promises work, let's start applying this in real development. Imagine you're building a website and you wanna fetch data from an API, maybe a list of users, products, or blog posts. You don't know how long that request will take, so you can't just sit around and wait for it. Your code needs to stay responsive. That's where promises shine. For example, let's use this free API to get a list of users from JSON Placeholder, which is a free placeholder API. It returns a list of fake users, perfect for testing. First, we're creating a promise called fetch users. This time, we'll use the fetch function inside it, which is built into JavaScript and lets us call APIs. This is alike to the situation we had earlier, where we declared a placeholder constant called data found. 
but instead of setting it to true or false, we're now tapping into a real API. As you know, this real API will respond with actual data or fail if something goes wrong, like a network error or the endpoint not being reachable. This means that we no longer decide the success manually like before. Now the API itself determines whether it works or not. But here's the thing. When the data from the API we fetched is ready, we know that it's still in a box, kind of like a package that's sealed. The server gives us that package, called the response, but we can't use what's inside yet. So let's handle it. First, let's declare a dot then function. The dot then function is like saying, when the data is ready, run whatever is inside this function. For example, let's unwrap the data we got from the API. We know that the API gives us a response object, right? Response.json is the tool that opens that box and gives us the actual content inside. In this case, the list of users. But we're still not done. Once we've opened the box and got the data, we now want to actually use it. Maybe show it on the screen or pass it to the rest of our code. So we need to add another dot then a function like this. This part is saying, when we finish unboxing the data, give it to whoever is waiting for it. But we also need to use our reject function to handle errors. This time, let's add a dot catch function for it. This is like saying, if something goes wrong while fetching or processing the data, let me know by rejecting the promise and tell me what the error was. So now the flow is, we fetch the API. We then wait for the response, unbox the response using .json function, and then pass the real data to the resolve function. So the outside dot then function can finally use it. And last, we catch the error if something goes wrong. Now outside of the promise, we can finally use the result. This part is like saying, when the promise is done, check what happened. If everything worked, the API responded, the data was unpacked and the promise was resolved, then the dot then function runs. It receives the actual user data and logs it. That's your success path. But if anything went wrong, if the API failed, there was no internet, or the server sent something weird, the dot catch function runs instead. That's your error path. This final step is important because it closes the whole async story. You start a promise and you wait for its result. Now, I know we're lazy. We don't want to keep writing out full promises every time we fetch something, right? So let me show you how to fetch from an API in a cleaner way. Earlier, we wrapped our fetch function in a custom promise, which is cool for learning. But in real development, fetch function already returns a promise. So we usually just write the syntax format. What's happening in here is we first call the API using fetch function. And since fetch already returns a promise by default, we don't need to wrap it ourselves like before. Then we use a dot then function to unbox the response, just like we did earlier using response.json. Remember, this turns the response into real usable JavaScript data like an array of posts. Next, if that part is successful, we chain another dot then, which gives us access to the actual data. And here we just log it using console log. And finally, we use dot catch to handle any errors that might happen, like a failed request or broken internet. It keeps our app from crashing and lets us show an error message instead. As you can see, we didn't need to manually use any resolve or reject here. That's because fetch already takes care of that under the hood. It's giving us a promise that either resolves when the data is fetched and converted properly or rejects when something goes wrong. This pattern is super common in real projects. Whether you're fetching blog posts, product info, user data, or anything from a server, this is the go-to flow. If you're working with APIs, this is something you'll be doing all the time. Another example of promises you will encounter is chained requests. For example, let's say we wanted to fetch a specific user. Let's use the fetch function and place our API endpoint URL. What we want to do next is open the data we got from the API. So we use dot then to proceed to the next step after the fetch is successful. Now we've got the actual user data from that first request. And here we're logging it just to see what we received. It might show the user's name, email, and other details, but we also want to fetch the related post of that user after getting the user's data. So still inside that dot then, after logging the user info, we then send another request. This one says, all right, now that I know who this user is, give me all the posts that belong to them. We do that by plugging in the user.id in the URL as a query. Same drill again. Once we get the posts response, we open up the box using .json so we can use the data. Now we've got the actual list of posts written by that user and we log them out. You could do more with this later, like showing them in the UI or filtering them. <laughs> if any of the fetches fail, like the internet is down or the API crashes, this dot catch will run. It's like a safety net. We log the error so we know something went wrong. In short, it's a chain reaction. Get user, get their posts, log both. If anything breaks, catch it. That's it, super clean, easy to follow. Now that we've learned the concept of a single promise, what if we could make multiple requests at the same time? For example, 
Here we are fetching the user's request and the post request and unboxing their data using the .json function. But what if we could fire both at once and wait for both results together? Introducing promise.all. Promise.all receives an array of promises. That's it. For example, inside the array, we put the user's request promise and the post's request promise. Because user's request and post request are both promises that will eventually give us the data. Promise.all waits for both to finish. In turn, we can now get their data at the same time. So instead of doing them one after the other, we're now doing them in parallel. That's why Promise All is such a powerful tool. It helps us save time and write cleaner code. We can use this when you need to get different data sources before rendering a UI, like dashboards, profile pages, and e-commerce stores and admin panels. There are also other functions besides dot all, like the dot all settled function, which waits for all promises regardless of success or failure. It returns an array of result objects. Each tells whether it was fulfilled or rejected. You can use it when you want all outcomes and don't want to stop even if some fail. We often see this in admin dashboards and social media timelines, where multiple independent widgets or cards are loaded, like stats, notifications, user info, and activity feeds. If one fails, the others still load. There's also promise.raise, which returns the result of the first promise to settle, whether it's fulfilled or rejected. Use it when you only care about who finishes first. For example, in search bars with live suggestions, like YouTube, Google, or Spotify, or in streaming apps. It lets you use the first available result from multiple sources or cancel slow responses if they exceed a timeout. And lastly, there's the dot any function, which returns the first promise that fulfills, ignoring any rejections. Fails only if all promises are rejected. Use it when you want any successful result and don't care which ones fail. We can often see this in CDN-based apps like document viewers, file downloaders, or in image-heavy sites like Pinterest and Unsplash, where you just want one valid source to work. For example, downloading an image or loading config from any server that responds. I know we learned a lot today about promises, which is why we're giving you a free PDF version of this video. It includes all the topics we covered, plus extra tips and tricks about working with promises, Become a Nova Plus member to get access to exclusive cheat sheets and playbooks. We'll be diving into more JavaScript content soon, like the spread operator and other useful concepts. So make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. Well, that's it for now, Novas. Thank you for watching.